Welcome to the Midland Money Mindset. This is a podcast that's all about getting your mind right when it comes to all things money. In every episode, we go deep with engaging guests who provide tangible takeaways and a whole lot of joy along the way. I hope you enjoy these conversations as much as I enjoyed having them. Let's dive into today's show. Well, I have the pleasure today of being with Daniel Carcillo, former NHLer, mental health advocate, and entrepreneur. And uh, as most of our listeners know, Dan, I love talking about hockey. I love talking about mental health because it's something I'm very passionate about. And I love talking about entrepreneurs. So you hit on all three marks. So welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks for having me, Larry. Yeah, it's uh, it's great to have you here. And, uh, you know, I'll start off by saying that uh, I'm a diehard Ranger fan. So I loved when you played for us in the uh, in the garden. It was uh, it was definitely a treat to see you there. Uh, that, was not nice, so much. That, was, that was a nice run. That was a nice yeah. run we had. Yeah. That been not really so much cool when though. you were playing against us with some of those other teams <laughs> that you played for, but yeah, with uh, the Flyers yeah. and the, and the Blackhawks. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was a uh, 2014 was a special time with, with Marty and, and it would have been, it would have been amazing to get that done uh, in that city. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, I have a lot of really great memories from it. They're still, they're still struggling to get that done, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how, we'll see how that goes. So, yeah. you know, listen, so, you know, for, for those listeners out there, you know, I talk a lot about hockey. So sometimes some, some may know who you are. Some may not be hockey. They may be on the entrepreneurial side of things. Can you just give folks a little bit of background about who Dan Carcillo is and kind of your path? And then we'll jump into the NHL stuff and then, you know, what you're up to today, but maybe you could just give them a, a 10,000 foot view of who you are. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I am about to turn 39 where my wife would, uh, has said numerous times that it's, that's gross. <laughs> and, uh, I'm from King city, Ontario. So I grew up in Canada, a small farming town and, and, uh, really a lot of our community revolved around the rink. Uh, I got drafted to the NHL when I was 17 years old, uh, 72nd or 73rd overall. And I started my NHL career right out of high school. Uh, when I was 19, uh, played uh, 10 years, and I was able to win uh, two Stanley Cups with the Blackhawks. I had four chances at it. We lost one with the with the Rangers and um, uh, one with the Flyers. 2010, I had 164 fights. I had seven diagnosed concussions. Uh, and when I retired, I was forced into retirement uh, because of my symptoms. Uh, I had mild dementia, so light sensitivity, slurred speech, headache, head pressure, classic uh, post-concussion syndrome. Uh, spent uh, from 2015 to 2019, spent time and money in the medical system, uh, couldn't get any better. Uh, went to do an alternative therapy uh, in, um, in Denver, Colorado of a, a decriminalized medicine. And I was able to regain my brain health and quality of life within, uh, within three months. Uh, got brain scans and, uh, with no abnormalities and blood work uh, that was totally clear. And I turned that into a business. I patented the regiment that was that I I created with a PhD biochemist using natural medicine, and we uh, built a deck to communicate the story. Found partners to raise to help me raise money, which I didn't really know how to do or how to network. Uh, and then we took it public on the CSE within three months of raising uh, sixteen million dollars, and we started to develop our FDA program. Uh, introduced. Um, uh, to the FDA back in March of 2021 and just kind of learned that whole game. And, and, um, and then now just really entrenched since 2019 in, uh, advocacy. Uh, so do a lot on, uh, congressional, uh, hearings and briefings on Capitol Hill through the psychedelic medicine coalition, uh, with Melissa Lavasani and, and support veterans. Uh, that's this t-shirt that I'm wearing. Uh, that uh, this medicine's you know positively impacted their life. This is No Fallen Heroes and Matthew Wiz Buckley, and and yeah, just uh, using my story to try to show people how to responsibly uh, use this medicine, re recover from concussion, mental health symptoms, but also well people executives uh, can use this to uh, to gain an edge on on the competition. Interesting. So did it gain FDA approval? No. So we did an IND, which is called uh, uh, investigational new drug application. We had our meeting and it was extremely successful. 
Uh, but what happened was the markets kind of took a turn for the worse. Uh, we were on the Canadian Stock Exchange, which has its own issues. And, you know, our, our stock was pretty much untouchable. Uh, so it was extremely hard for me to raise money. So I ended up finding a new home for it. Uh, uh, for I sold it to a NASDAQ listed company. We also owned and operated three ketamine clinics, which I sold prior to the FDA program. And uh, I was hoping uh, that, uh, that, you know, this company was going to develop it. Didn't really know what was going to happen with me and if I was going to move on. But um, uh, yeah, since I've since moved on to, to some other projects and we're obviously really gotcha. proud of, of what we were able to do. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, I, I, listen, I applaud you for all of your work within the mental health space and in the concussion space, because uh, I, I don't know if you're aware or not. I lost my brother-in-law about 20 years ago to suicide. Mm. So ever since that. then, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, ever since then, I sat on the national board for about 14 years of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and mm. uh, it's something that's very important to me and and my family. And uh, you know, uh, I, I've been a mental health advocate uh, since his passing in 2004. So mm. people like you, people like me, that we continue that have that conversation, that hopefully veterans and and other folks that are suffering out there uh, will feel more comfortable to find the assistance that they need and you know, be able to uh, come out of the darkness and, and find a way to live a, uh, a healthier life. So thank you for that. Of course. Yeah. I was doing kind of a year end inventory as people do. Uh, and I was pretty astonished to find out that the second leading cause of death uh, for men between 18 and, and I think it's 45 or 50 is suicide. Yeah, And, you know, I really believe it's partly because, uh, there's no sense of community or like coming of age or sense of understanding who you are. Uh, and, and obviously men have an issue <laughs> talking. So hopefully, you know, through my story, I've obviously gotten a lot of messages saying, you know, people looked at me as like one of these, you know, tough guys that, um, and they think that tough guys aren't sensitive when it's, you know, I'm extremely sensitive, you know, okay. and, uh, and, and so, uh, I encourage if anybody's listening out there and, and you're struggling to like go and research these treatments. There's, there's tons of different treatments and I'm not just talking about medicine treatment. Uh, there's, you know, float tanks and hyperbaric chambers and, and peptides and IVs and getting out in the sunlight. And, and there's so many new things that you can try. And, and if you like what you hear and you like what you see, then, um, you know, and you're struggling, just make sure to, to find me or find some, type of community that you can engage in, uh, because, you know, um, the alternative is scary, but, you know, living, mm -hmm. getting out of it is, uh, is, is pretty rewarding. Agreed. Agreed. Well, thank you for sharing that. Can, you know, I know you, you kind of glossed over the highlights of your, uh, your time in the NHL, mm -hmm. but, uh, can you, can you share a bit about it? Like what were some of the real meaningful points in, in your career that you're like, you know, when you think back about your time in the NHL, you're, you know, you immediately go to those points in time. I think breaking into the NHL was pretty cool. Uh, I, so I graduated high school at 19 and, and went right into the AHL, which is a kind of like a feeder team, uh, in the Pittsburgh Penguin system, played a year and a half there. And then I got called up to Arizona where Wayne Gretzky was my coach. Grant Fear was there. Uh, Off Samuelson was the D coach. So it was like pretty, pretty cool to uh, right. to be coached by by the great one in uh, in Arizona. So that you know those first two years really really stuck out in my mind. Uh, I really made a name for myself. He liked the way I, excuse me, he liked the way I played because I was so old school and uh, and the game was kind of just starting to get into this new phase of like people were like, well, I'm gluten free now and and you know like just <laughs> some weird things. Um, and so that was, that really sticks out. Then I got traded to Philly, uh, because I asked for a trade and I, I just really wanted to be in a market where I, where I was going to feel like wanted and appreciated because the style that I played, uh, Philly was, you know, my, my favorite team growing up. So, um, kind of serendipitous that I ended up there and, you know, just, it was just really cool to have a city like that. Just you know, be, be behind Broad street you. bullies. So, but, yeah. It was nice. <laughs> uh, so, and then, I mean, we had an amazing run in 2010. We got in on the last shootout, uh, against the Rangers, you know, Jeru scored against Lundquist and, and Jokinen, yeah. uh, got stopped by, 
by Brian Boucher. So that was cool. Mike Richards, you know, Scott Hartnell, Aaron Asham, uh, all the guys that were Jeff Carter, all the guys that were on that team. We were so close. It was, it was great. Uh, those were some really formidable years. And then when I got to Chicago, uh, after we lost in 2010 to the Blackhawks, I, I signed with Chicago, uh, came, came to that city, uh, met, you know, Steve Monitor, a really good friend who kind of, at that point I had like kind of a decision to make. I was pretty, I was a pretty wild boy on and off the ice and I started getting hurt and these sorts of things. So I, I actually asked, that was the first time I asked for help. And then I went to learn about, you know, meditation and breath work and these kind of like holistic tools to get down after a game. I don't think too many guys talk about, you know, we're on at 7 PM till midnight, you know, right. and then we get home and you're still, or you're flying to another city, et cetera. So like getting down classic muscle relaxers, opiates were really big. That was when that pandemic was just kind of starting alcohol. Um, so I, I, you know, formed some habits that I wanted to break. So when I got to Chicago, met Steve Monitor, he helped me, helped me break them. And then Man, my last five years in the league, I, I went to the Stanley Cup Finals four times with three different teams. So, um, yeah, all of it. You know, winning is obviously, um, you know, something that we all want to do, right? And so when you when sure. you dedicate so much of your young life to one thing, getting to the top of the echelon in the mountain, in, you know, calling yourself the best hockey team in the world two times over is, is pretty damn cool. Um, right. Yeah, and then... Um, you know, hockey's given me everything that I have today. It gave me my sickness. It, it, uh, you know, it, it's given me a life after hockey, uh, being able to just be tenacious enough to, to try to find treatments and cure myself of mild dementia and these brain injury symptoms and, and hopefully just carrying a message of hope to others. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that for a second. Cause, uh, you know, your players tribune article about head trauma was a, a powerful one. Can, can you share why you felt you needed to step forward and address the health of your brain? Like, what was that moment that said, Hey, I, I gotta, I gotta do something about this. Yeah. I'm thank, thank you for asking. Uh, so it was 2014, 15, my last season, uh, we won our second Stanley cup. So I'll give you the sequence of events. We started the year in 14. I, uh, my son was born in November season starts in September. And, and so that was amazing because all, all I've ever wanted to do uh, was be a dad. And, and so he was born. So I was like, ah, I, my dad worked a lot and that's just kind of how he showed his love. And I was like, I don't really want to travel for 186 days. Like I want to a year, I want to like be there with him. Right. right. So I kind of had one foot out the door and then Steve had been struggling with concussions. He had 19, he was cleared for 19 in the league. Um, and he'd really been like me and him were obviously still talking and he ended up passing away in February. So that, that really crushed me. That really, I remember getting the call while I, it was during pregame, my phone kept buzzing, 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 buzzing. I'm like, something's, something's not right. right. And so I picked it up and, and, uh, that just, yeah, that, that crushed me, um, spiritually, mentally, physically, I was kind of already at the end of my rope. That was 10 years, a long time to be, yes. to be a pro hockey player. And, and then, um, what what sealed the deal was I got my seventh concussion in March. So I wasn't, I asked to not play again, but we'd already made the playoffs and I got in against Philly, believe it or not. And I was just so dejected and, and, and sad and angry, frustrated, all the things that I, I wanted to fight and I wanted to get hit, got my seventh concussion. And those symptoms lingered for four or five weeks, which really scared me. Um, and so I just had a decision to make uh, where I was really angry and frustrated and sad. And I wanted to understand, like I watched the Blackhawks clear him for four concussions in a matter of 12 weeks, which would, would, would be a detriment to anybody, regardless sure. if it was his 16th, 17th, 18th and 19th concussion. So I just wanted to make a video and I thought I knew I was going to basically cut off my foot <laughs> to keep my hand, meaning you don't say anything bad about professional sports, especially the right. NHL. If you, if you, if you step out of line, that community will effectively cut you off. But I, I was making a conscious decision to cut my, myself off from this community. So I, um, I called, you know, the players tribune. It was the first video that we made and I just sat in my living room and, and you can still see the pain and hear it in my voice. Uh, and, and not the, I still didn't remove myself to understand, 
um, all the things that were happening to me emotionally. And I just made a call, a call to arms. Like we need uh, trainers telling me to just stay home and then come to the rink when I didn't have symptoms. That's not good enough, right? Like we need some sort of better diagnostic and some sort of better recovery. And I need to honor my friend. And so I made this video and I'm also, I like to think I'm, I'm smart and calculated Hockey doesn't get watched a lot, right? So I made the video and I dropped it before the Stanley Cup Finals because it's the only time that there's so much press. And it mm-hmm. just it blew up, you know. Um, and and then I retired. I retired. Uh, and I retired again with a lot of uh, vitriol. I, I didn't go to the banner raising. I... I, you know, kind of left the country four days after. I was, I was super sick. And that's really when the biggest fight in my life started where I had to figure out where all these concussion symptoms were coming from and how to fix my brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's uh, that's some story, but at the same time, I think that it really started paving the wave or the, the way for a lot more attention to be placed on these injuries and, you know, things that hopefully I, I, I think you probably know better than I do. I think they're taking it a little bit more seriously today. I'm not sure that we're there yet, um, but I, I think we're a lot better than where we were, you know, let's say 10 years ago, for sure. There's a lot more awareness. There's a lot more education. I, the NHL is still a professional league that doesn't admit a link between repetitive head trauma and neurodegenerative disease. They're the last league on earth. And I mean, there's a pretty clear correlation, uh, but it's, you know, it's like smoking doesn't cause lung cancer, right? Right. Like, (laughs) um, so I, I've really tried to put myself in a space of, of not highlighting the, the problems because that seems to attract more negativity into my life. And I, I, I just made a decision at a point in 2019 where I was suicidal I was creating kind of my own hell and, and I just move over here now where there's always going to be corporations and, and, and businesses and sports that are going to make people sick. I want to just live over here where people can know once you do get sick, we can help you, you know? Right. So I I think that's a good, good place to be. And they've moved up like the age of hitting and stuff. They have made a few, Right. They have made a yeah. few um I have adjustments. made some adjustments. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Now, as as a dad whose uh, son is uh, most likely going to be moving on to juniors next year and, um, you know, somebody whose, uh, you know, son's friends and, and contemporaries are some of them are arguably in juniors now or entering next year or in the next couple of years. You know what what compelled you to come forward about you know, your situation and your story of abuse during your junior hockey days, what, what made you come out about that? So I actually got triggered, uh, in, I think it was 2016 or 17. I don't remember exactly. There was a story from St. Mike's, uh, Academy, which I grew up in Toronto. It's a pretty well-known okay. prevalent, you know, in a very rich affluent neighborhood in Toronto, downtown Toronto. And it was a story of, of these kids, you know, um, basically getting, getting sodomized, uh, as a part of a ritual, as part of a hazing act, which is completely not the act being normal, but the, the act of hazing and initiating rookies Mm -hmm. is completely normal and has been for four or five decades. And, and all of a sudden I had this panic attack when I read the story and I was still dealing with my concussion and, and all the anger and all the things spiritually. And I, I, I remember walking to the washroom and my wife seeing me, I had to get like, take a cold shower and she's like, what's going on? And I said, I don't really know, <laughs> you know? And then I just started to think about, uh, junior and, and what, so I had this nickname car bomb. Mm-hmm. on the ice and I'm a very gentle sensitive that's not who I was but what I realized then playing this back is is I was hazed sexually physically emotionally abused by both coaches and you know about 13 guys for the for the course of a year it was really bad uh and 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 it was just all that trauma kind of coming back uh and I also realized too that um 
good or bad, you know, I've, I've gotten into this place where, where I can talk about trauma and be thankful for it because I don't know if I would have had such a long career if that didn't happen to me and if I didn't play the way that Carbon played. So, yeah. but at the end of the day, it is wrong. And uh, one thing I do know how to do is hold people accountable. And so I had a platform at the time. It was Bullying Awareness Week. And I just decided to write about it. And I think I wrote like a nine or 10 page post on Twitter. And I put it out there and it got a, a ton of a ton of traction. And then and now we have, uh, you know, this class action lawsuit moving through Canada and I'm the uh, lead plaintiff. And and I just want to make sure that it doesn't happen again. I want to make sure that there's oversight with these leagues. And I want to make sure that that if anything, God forbid, ever happens to your son or any of your friends, sons, that they have a place and an outlet to actually report it anonymously, right. you know, so okay. that so that they don't, you know, it doesn't affect the rest of their life and, and hockey career. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think what people don't realize, some, well, some people, if you're if you're connected in the hockey world, you certainly realize it. But many people don't realize, you know, that I, I guess how it works, like in juniors, you're typically living with a family right in mm -hmm. their home. You know, is there a vetting process for that family or not? There are so many different avenues between, you know, the, the safety and security of the team. You hope that doesn't go awry. Then you mm -hmm. have these coaches who are grown adults looking after basically teenage kids, right? Because that's what, for the most part, you are. And then you have living with a family. So there are so many opportunities that there's got to be that oversight to protect these players. And like you said, if, if the protection doesn't, uh, do its job, there has to be a mechanism for them to come out and feel comfortable about making sure that they say something so that yeah. it doesn't continue the cycle, right? And it's so that it doesn't continue the cycle, but then also if your son's going to say something that's not his fault to get initiated, it can't affect right. him then moving on in hockey. Because right. again, like I made that Players' Tribune video, as soon as I did that, I knew I was never going to get a job in hockey ever again mm -hmm. by just telling the truth. So there's such a power imbalance between coaches and players when you're in junior and they hold your career in their hands. If scouts call and say, ah, this guy's a little bit of a problem. Ah, this guy's a little bit of a rat. Ah, this guy doesn't toe the line. Your son's done. Right. You're, you're, it's over, right? So you accept the trauma. You accept the abuse that you know that's wrong in order. At least this is what I did in my own experience. I was like, man, I'm not going to let these guys, right, take me down. Like, I'm going mm -hmm. to make it, you know. And so I'm just going to accept this for the next year. I'm not going to do it to other individuals next year. I'm going to try to protect them. And I'm going to get out of this. And I'm going to make it. And right. and I did. It brought on addiction issues and these other things because that's the underlying. Well, you don't, you don't realize that at the time, right? Not you're, at the you're... time, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're, but, young, um, you're young. It's tough. Absolutely. It's tough. But again, it was also a piece of me, and it's funny that we're having this conversation right now because uh, uh, I'm going through a lot of this transition where I'm turning 39 and I don't think that this anger and this violence and my need for holding people accountable and wanting revenge on people that have wronged me in business, it doesn't serve me anymore. You know, I, I, I had a really tough like two years and then the last week, I, it was, it got really dark. And so I'm like, I, I, um, I use the medicine and, and, and I, I realize now that that stuff did serve me for a really long time and I needed it. I just, I don't, I don't think I need it anymore. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of leave that behind. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And listen, that's uh, growing and moving on too. That's, uh, you know, all part of the process, you know, so, I mean, obviously we don't live in an ideal world right now where, all, you know, this, um, this whole situation that you kind of outline where the players feel this level of ability to have these conversations without retribution, it, it doesn't exist necessarily today. You know, they, they may profess that it does, but I, I don't know that it really does. You it know, doesn't, players, not yet, not yet. Right. So if, if for players today who currently find them in a, in a bad situation, abusive, you know, whether it be, you know, hazing, coaching, whatever, you know, what would you like them to know? What, what, you know, what would you like to share with those people out there that might be mm. in a precarious situation? 
Man, that's a good question. I would, if any, if anyone out there is, is getting abused by somebody, number, the, I think the number one thing to understand, there's a lot of shame and guilt that comes along with that because you think it's your fault. It's not your fault. These people, uh, the coaches that let it go, that know about it, and the players that are doing it are, are obviously traumatized. And, and trauma and abuse is really easy. It's easy to continue the cycle. And so that's a tough question because sometimes the league does have some of these outlets, depending on where they are. If they mm-hmm. could go to somebody within the organization that, that they can trust, that would be a good outlet. What we did to get through all of that, yes, eventually I reported it, but what we did was all the rookies just hung out together and we would just talk. You know, we would, we would, we had a Dairy Queen night all the time and we wouldn't let any of the veterans come and we would just, we would just vent, you know, we just, so I guess find some sort of outlet. And if you love what you're doing enough, then you'll find a way to sometimes deal with the bad stuff. Sometimes you, and it's your decision to make for me. I made a decision that I wanted to be a hockey player bad enough that I was going to kind of eat this, you know what, Mm -hmm. right now to get to the next level. I was not going to let somebody hold me down. And then eventually I did. I found treatment and I found talk therapy. I've been in it. I was in it for 15 years, you know, and I, 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 then I gained this type of understanding, you know? Yeah. And and I think, you know, to be fair, I think that there are also, you know, various ranging, very widely ranging things that could potentially happen, right? Absolutely. Some of them are very, very innocent, like, you know, carry the bags, sit at the front of the bus. Like these these sorts of things should happen, right? It's just a respect level. Show respect, you're given respect. So no, and it's not all doomsday. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, but just, uh, just, yeah, just be on guard and, and, and mind your P's and Q's and just be respectful. You know, it's, it's, it's the same thing as respecting your elders, you know, that's, that's really what being a first year player is kind of all about. Now I, I remember, I, I think it was in high school or college when I was playing, there was some bit of hazing that went on with the new players but it was Mm. like they if i'm remembering this correctly because it was a long time ago they usually shaved the guy's heads like unwillingly right yeah i guess you know looking back now in the grand scheme of all these things that take place it was probably rather innocuous compared to (laughs) a lot of these other things but yeah i I I yeah, that's, I remember that's having nothing. The, <laughs> right. But I remember having these guys come up to me and were like ready to do it. And I was like, listen, you could try, but I ain't going, I'm going down with a fight. So uh-huh. as long as you guys uh-huh. are willing to come out of this with a black eye or lost teeth, like we're Let's good go. to go. And, yeah, and it never, that's... it never, it never came to fruition. Um, but that's uh, when it, uh, that's when it all stopped. Right. Like when, when a bunch of us just started swinging, we just, right. All right like no more, you know, it's been, and sometimes months. you have to do that. Right. Yeah. That's why you got to stand up for yourself. Right. What do you do to a bully? If there's a bully right. who's bullying you, you try to, if you stand up one time, they usually stop. Yeah. So let, let's talk about this, right? You have a son now, you know, yeah. uh, how, how old is he now? Uh, he just turned nine. Okay. So, you know, he's entering those four, you know, he's in those formative years. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, I see, you know, very frequently is when, you know, bad things are happening. A lot of times people sit around and watch, right. They don't, they, they act, you know, they stand around as a bystander watching what's going on. You know, how do we get more young people to be upstanders and actually intervene, say something, you know, stand up for their fellow teammate, their fellow classmate, what have you. How, mm. how do we do that? So I think it starts with the home, you know, and it starts with the man of the home, to be honest with you, right? So like my job, I have four kids, I have three daughters and, and Austin's the only boy. So we're, we're outnumbered four to two <laughs> uh, and uh, by women. And so I make it a point to make sure that I grab him 
every day to have a conversation with him face to face about, you know, meditation, visualizing who he wants to be, where he wants to go, how he wants to act in school, etc. And then also, um, you know, making sure that I grab him at least once a week and we have our man time, you know, Mm -hmm. like I said, like that stats a scary stat. And, and it's, I would, I'd be interested to find out how many of those suicides are correlated with us, with having a single parent, specifically a mom in the house. Um, And I just think that men need men, men need community. And in this world where they seem to be wanting to feminize everything and, and weaken everything, uh, this kind of woke movement going on that I'm kind of watching from afar, men need to be men. There's nothing wrong with being a strong man, you know, and there's nothing wrong with understanding my view of a strong man might be different from yours, but that doesn't make me wrong and that doesn't make you right and vice versa. So I just try to create this world that I want to see and that I think will harbor a good, respectable man. That doesn't mean that like if my son ever goes out of this house and becomes a bully, it would crush me because... I was bullied, you know, like, <laughs> and I was that guy too. Let me be very right. clear, right? And so, um, I just try to teach him and impart. Without, I don't try to tell him these things because kids hate being told what to do. Right. I try right. to show him these things, you know. And um, luckily, he's got YouTube. It's probably why he's you know all gung ho about playing hockey now at at nine, um, and he can see these things. You know, I sit here in front of this camera and I, I try to tell people my thought process, and and um, I think it's valuable because of what I did, what I applied myself to, and then how I'm, how I'm ever evolving and growing. You know, right. so so yeah, just time. I think time, one on one time. Uh, or in a group setting, whatever is really, really important for men. Yeah, I listen. I agree with you. I think like I, I have two boys, and now they're uh, twenty and uh, seventeen, and nice. I, I see how they act. Like people are shocked. They open doors. They yeah. say please and thank you. And Absolutely. that's because my, you know, I did that. Right. Yeah, man. I did that. They saw it. They saw my wife do that. They saw me do that. They, they you know, they, they brought up that they were brought up that way. Sponges. Um, Isn't it remarkable it, how, how, yeah. how crazy these kids see everything. They everything. do. The good, Whether you the think bad. they do or not, they're watching. Oh, I'm always they're looking. Watching. They're always looking up and listening and, and I'm not perfect. You know, I, I missed a lot of time you know, uh, because I was so involved in myself and suffering from these symptoms. So I'm just really, I mean, I'm just really grateful that I'm connected to myself and, and that I have this special relationship. I talk to my kids like adults, you know, they're nine, six, five. Yeah. And, and seven months, obviously not the seven month old yet, but, uh, yeah, I, I I give it to them straight, you know, uh, I don't sugarcoat anything. Yeah, we've always done that. And, you know, my wife and I always were on the same page. Our our job was to raise good humans, adult, good human adults. That was yeah. that was our job, you yep. know. And uh, if we do that, then, you know, we, we hit the mark. So yeah. so let me ask you a question as you know, it's clear that you still, you know, on the periphery, like, you know, love the time that you had in the NHL, love the time that you had with hockey. You know, what do you think the future holds for the game? You know, it sounded like your son's kind of playing now. I don't know if any of your daughters are too. Um, But, you know, what do you think the future of the game holds? I think it's obviously turning into a a very skilled game uh, during the regular season, which is kind of not strange. I mean, it's more exciting, right? They're trying to bring they're trying to bring a different fan base to it. Why I think it's a little bit strange is because at the end of the day, when you get into a seven game series and four rounds against the same team, the crux of that is to take their will to play away. So, for example, if it's game one and it's six to one and there's 10 minutes left in the third and you know you're losing that game and you're probably not going to come back, you're still finishing every check because you have they have to win three more games. You know, you're still trying to. Yeah, you're still trying to break them down. You're trying to take their will to play away. 
So, um, but you know, it's exciting. Uh, the Bedards of the world and, and all these kids want to do is stick handle and, and, and sauce and, and skate fast. And it's good that, you know, I do agree on some levels, right. That, um, the fighting has lessened, meaning like I could never understand even while I was playing like these heavyweight guys, like at the beginning of the game, just brah, fight. And it's like, what, <laughs> what is that? What is that? You know, right. uh, I always I always tried to earn a fight, meaning I went and smoked somebody and then let's go to change the momentum of a game. There was always a reason it, it wasn't just like you know, um, two meatballs just kind of going at it. And then also you use the fight to like, make sure you hold people accountable so that they don't take liberties on anybody. So, um, but the game I think is in a good spot, man. Uh, ESPN has picked it up. Young kids are, are, are wanting to sign up for it, I think. Um, and, and yeah, I think it's, I think it's just going to get faster and, and, and more exciting. Awesome. Well, I look forward to seeing it. So listen, Dan, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. We ask each of our guests the same last question, because this is the Midland Money Mindset, and we're all about joy. And that is, what did you do today that brought you joy and put you in the right mindset for success? (laughs) I told you, you caught me at the right time. Um, (laughs) So I... I woke, I made a contract with myself over the weekend. I told you I had a, a really difficult week last mm-hmm. week. Uh, I woke up at 6 a.m. I was out of the door at 6.15 and I ran and worked out until 7.15, came back to the house, uh, saw my kids off to school, was back in my desk by 7.55 and I started to re- record my book. And and so from eight to nine, that's my routine now for the next foreseeable future until I can finish that book. And working out, exercising is, is really important to me. And, and it seems to put me in the right frame of mind as well as coming home and making sure I do one thing in recovery. So whether that's meditation, breath work, or usually both within a cold plunge. So I have a, Mm -hmm. I have a cold plunge. I like cold exposure. And, um, you know, so those are the things that I, I, I need to feel physically fit in order to feel mentally and spiritually fit. Um, so those are the things I do and to, to prioritize my health and my mindset. Great stuff. Are you a follower of Wim Hof? No, no. I mean, I know of him obviously, uh, but, uh, (laughs) my, um, well, what's funny is this, this trend is, you know, getting popular, but we've been, I've been doing cold times since I was 12 or 13 years old mm-hmm. they were always right. in the rooms right, right. so like yep. and it's great though that this is getting popular for people because i think it's for the mind to be able to breathe i think some level of suffering is good right uh mm-hmm. and if you're if you're not you know raising your kids in that light where you're kind of challenging them within your own household and making them uncomfortable then i think you're doing them a disservice because this world is tough business yeah. is tough yeah. being an entrepreneur great extremely tough. So you're, um, so yeah, so all of these things and, and, and more, you know, there's, there's other tools, but, uh, yeah, sure. maybe, yeah, maybe when, for when, another when my time. son first went to uh, boarding school, he was like, I'm never going in the cold tub. And we were like, Hey, there's a, there's a lot of benefits to it. We, we encouraged him to do it. Best. And now he loves Best. going in there. You know, oh, does, does he love to, you know, will he go in there for an hour? No, but he likes going in, taking a, you know, a dip and staying in there for like five, 10 minutes just That's to it. refresh and recharge. And he's gotten used to it. And, uh, you know, he's a big body. So hopefully it'll keep him in, uh, in good shape. Right. Better yeah. Shape. The That's number one result. thing it does is, uh, is help, help you make, it helps make you feel lighter. So it burns off something called lactic acid. So if you've right. ever worked out and then the next day you feel heavy, Cramping. that's that yeah. la- and, and cold exposure for just three minutes can help release all of that lactic acid so that you can go back and, and do it again the next day. And if you don't work out that day, it's just a really good reset, um, mm-hmm. you know, in the morning to, to just, right. to just get the mind and nervous system going. Get you rolling. Yeah. So listen, Dan, we'll have all of your information in the show notes, but if people cool. want to connect with you, learn more about what you're up to, you know, many of the things that you just discussed, what's the easiest and the best place for them to go to find out that information? So uh, X is Carbon Boom 13. Uh, Instagram is Daniel Carcillo 13. 
and I'm obviously on LinkedIn, Daniel Carcillo, Facebook, uh, launching. Well, when this comes out, my website will already be up. So, uh, Daniel and, uh, people, you know, we can, we do, you know, group workshops that are, that are free and, and by the time this comes out, those will be, those will all be going. Um, so those are all the socials and then a couple projects that we have going on right now is, um, uh, healing realty trust, which is, we are building out the infrastructure for, uh, experiential medicine or psychedelic medicines that are approved through the FDA. So we're partnering with physicians and, and, um, you know, you have to go into the clinic to experience Mm -hmm. these medicines, which, that doesn't exist and um yeah continuing the advocacy work so you know just uh just stay posted on that as well and when's the book scheduled to come out uh i I just started i mean i did i did my first hour today uh i've got an ai tool that's um i should be done within 30 days you know i looking for that yeah i mean it's it's gonna be self-published uh it'll be it'll be It'll be free for probably the first like six months online and I'll figure out what to, you know, what to do with it. And, and, um, and, you know, ultimately what I want to come of it is, uh, some sort of, um, you know, mental health speaking tour. That's cool. You know, where like Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's some tubs and, and, and gadgets on the stage that people can interact with, et cetera. And we can, uh, you know, hit the road and, and show people how to use some of these tools to, to benefit, you know, their life. Nice. Well, yeah. thanks again, Dan. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing. Appreciate it. I appreciate you taking out the time and uh, enjoy the day. Thanks, buddy. You too.